All right, well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning. I'm glad you're here. Um, we'll start with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for all of your glorious creation and for guiding us as we contemplate how Jesus' cleansing work on the cross draws us closer and closer into a relationship with you. God, open our eyes to the places that we are vulnerable and allow us to lean into the ways you desire to purify us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. This morning, I'm Vicki Rockholt. Arden Hansel. Stan J Jacobson. Nancy Jacobson. Jean Anderson. Tom McCullough. Uh, John Hutchison. Andrea Fry. Matt Paul. And good morning and to all the people at home as well. Yeah, Lou, it looks like Lou and maybe Grant are joining us. Wonderful. She's connecting here. Oh, good well, morning. Are they in Hawaii? <laughs> On the trip somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So we had a request at the end of our, our session last time to go back to page 82, 83 in our book, Savior, and, and go through this section about the church that we long for. So I'll read the first bit and then just to refresh our memories on the context of this bit. And then, um, and then Jean, you had a request that we maybe go around and read these words that, that were created. Sure. Yeah, okay, okay. So the church we long for, and this is from the chapter Reconciliation, Jesus Restores Your Relationship. The reconciling work of Jesus makes possible a vision for the church in which we are not only brought together in unity across our differences, but we can be a unifying voice for the divided world, for a divided world. That kind of church is part of the imagination of God and can be a compelling vision for us to realize today. Once at the conclusion of a sermon, I invited people in the pews to call out words and phrases that complete this statement. The church I long for is, the result was one of the most inspired moments in worship that we had had in a long time. People kept calling out words and phrases from all corners of the room and we couldn't write them down fast enough. Their responses included these actual words. And there's a long paragraph of those words. So I thought we could each, you know, if, we would, if you want, go around in a circle and each person read maybe three or four of the suggestions offered by that congregation. If you don't want to read, you could say pass, but it means you've got to follow along <laughs> where we are. I'll start. Welcoming, okay. unconditionally loving, inclusive. Overflowing with love, accepting. The way to Jesus unified, love, peaceful, more. Always asking questions, always learning, authentic diversity. Open to change, trustworthy, does not discriminate. Is going to change the world, works outside its walls, constantly tries to listen. Bold and creative, keeps old traditions and find new ones, is not afraid. Sees you, accepts all who Jesus would accept, continues to make God's love real. Balances confidence and humility, changes as needed, invests in future generations. Has no borders, has no walls, accepting, tolerant, loving. Is not satisfied, comfortable in gray areas, okay with saying it doesn't know all the answers. Building bridges, united in diversity, warm the struggle. Thank you. Thank you all for reading along. So, when I think about, actually, I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking about what is a church? And we know it's more than the building, right? It's, it's the people who come here. And then I was thinking, really, it's the relationship, relationships between the people who are here and our relationship with God and our relationships outside of our congregation and our church walls, right? And so a lot of these are about that. Some of it is about who we are with each other and some of it is about who we can be outside of our, our church walls. So anybody have thoughts about this section? Well, 
I want to add uh, another one. Unlimited forgiveness. Ah. I read that in the Henri Duen, you know, <laughs> what you call it, uh, devotion. Yeah. So I thought that was really something. Unwilling forgiveness. Or no, no, unlimited, no. <laughs> un <laughs> unlimited <laughs> forgiveness. <laughs> My tongue gets tough. Yeah. <laughs> unlimited forgiveness that we have from God, right? Yeah. That we could share with others mm -hmm. and hopefully with each other, forgiving each other too, mm -hmm. not just from God, but or forgiving ourselves mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Not always easy. It's not. <laughs> I think of the word unlimited, unlimited forgiveness for myself. Even. <laughs> yeah, good. Anything else on that? Well, I like the, um, I like to draw that. I like to always asking questions, which I think is what's happening in this group. Um, always learning. Open to change. Mm -hmm. I think our church has a lot of these attributes. I do. <laughs> but I love our church. And maybe I'm, you know, <laughs> I have my own blinders on filters, but I think we do a pretty good job. Um, as a newcomer, I would say, I think you are, they do as well. Mm -hmm. There's always room for growth, right? And always need for change. And it's good to see all these words, all these thoughts and ideas. Just as, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where are we or where could I grow a bit? Right. I'm hoping that our church has this kind of a conversation regularly, you know, about who are we and where, where do we need to grow. I know we have in the past and I'm sure we will in the future. <clears throat> Be interesting for you to put that out there sometime. Yeah. It's your I don't know what form, but you just had paper, everybody could write a piece of paper or just to ask them. Oh. Like they said, it's hard to write it all down at one time. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go on to chapter five. Cleansing, Jesus makes you clean. So, certainly none of us are exempt from the temptations of sin, right? And so today we're going to explore how Jesus came to redeem and purify our hearts. So in this understanding of the cross, um, sin, what is sin in this understanding? On page 105. It's a sin is a stain that we cannot cleanse on our own. It is more than just a superficial account of our wrongdoings. Sin sinks deep into our innermost being, affecting the way we think, act, feel, and relate to others. And then salvation. Can I read that first? Arda? Jesus is the fulfillment of Hebrew understanding of the scapegoat. He cleanses us of our sins by taking sin upon himself. He becomes dirty so that we might be made clean. So what is what are your initial reactions to this understanding of Jesus' death? Say that again. I'm sorry. What are your initial reactions to this? I think it's very, um, it's actually very comforting. You know, I mean, as I'm reading through this book, I think I see it all as kind of as describing facets of what it is first. I see all of them as part of. Or um, I see uh, all of them as uh, different facets of the purpose of, um, of the crucifixion and 
and this is just part of it, but it, it was very comforting. This one. Okay. I had, I struggled with the, the scapegoat idea because, because I don't want to be putting myself on Jesus. You know, like I didn't want Jesus to be the recipient of our felt, the word felt. Maybe especially was hard for me. But anyway, I think we'll, we'll talk more about that later in the conservation of filth <laughs> that, that law that comes up. Okay. So the Bible contains numerous passages equating sin with being unclean and sin polluting our relationship with God. It's clear that sin stains and tarnishes everything around it. And this is never more evident than in the life of King David. So the author really delved into that in our book. But how about if we take a look at some biblical passages? So 2 Samuel 11. This tells the story of David and Bathsheba. Are you ready to read that? Second Samuel 11. Or just the first verse? Or? Yeah, first verse would be great. I think I've got in this room we hear the time the king's got about David and Jacob, but there's an all of them. They vowed on land and besieged God, but David remained in Jerusalem. Is that the other one? Yeah. Okay. And so our author of Savior speculates that David stayed home on page 92, back and forth. Back and forth. Um, so we're so sure of victory, right? Yeah. And then he needed to go and send the, send the uh, generals. Okay, and in the case of David, how might his success have weakened his character? Well, when you compare him to his general, right, um, to the guy he had killed, whatever his name was. What, what you, Uriah? Yeah, you're right, right. So, um, remember he had Uriah come to see him, and he was, and he was going to send him out to be in the front line, and he said, but why don't you go home and, and be with your wife? Maybe your last night with her, or whatever. And he said, "No, no." Your eyes said, "No." You know, he kind of took the honor code. My guys are out there. I'm not gonna. Um, I'm gonna sort of take take part of the hardship that they're experiencing. Unlike David, who he decided to remain in comfort, and in fact that. Kind of got into trouble with the saga. So, I don't know. yeah, and our author on page 92 asks us to consider that <clears throat> the biblical principle here is that just because things might be going well in your life, it does not mean you can let your guard down in your daily life against sin. And in fact, you may be the kind of person that's most vulnerable when you're feeling most confident. And that this is what happened with David. So this daily battle against sin. Um, and that he saw Bathsheba as just another acquisition and her husband as another obstacle, problem to be eliminated. So the author says that sin can blind us into thinking that we can handle power and control. I'm thinking about that in my life. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's look at second, <clears throat> second Samuel again, um, verse 12, or chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. 
Anybody want to read that out loud for us? But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Um, and the Lord sent uh, Nathan to him, to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had uh, bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup. This is not one I'd want. <laughs> and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. He was loath to take one of his own flock or herd and to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the land fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man, said the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you uh, from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of it, of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun through 12. Yes, I third, did the whole thing. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So there we have Nathan opening David's eyes to sin in an unexpected sort of a way. Uh, <clears throat> a vengeful, you know, kind of a vengeful way, eye for an eye. Yeah. And so what was David's response? Maybe not there. Well, or maybe next verse. Okay. Next verse. I'm going to read that. I have sinned oh, against the Lord, he said to Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord. Yeah, right. And then we can see David's confession in Psalm 51. There's a portion of it on page 93 in our book. And there are lots of words in this excerpt on page 93 that have to do with washing and cleansing. And so you know, here's, here's part of it. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. So that's part of one of our hymns, isn't it, right? Um, so David was not just asking to be cleansed and forgiven for his sins, but to have his whole life restored. And in verse 12, he asks the Lord to return the joy of your salvation. Also in that last part that I read, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Wherever we see the word heart in the Bible, and now I'm reading from 93 in the, in the book. Wherever you see the word heart in the Bible, 
Remember that ancient Israelites understood the heart as the seat of intelligence and emotion, so the core of their being. So he's not just asking for a change in his feelings, but a complete reboot of his values, his perspective, and his behavior. Any thoughts on that part? So a little further down on 93, David says, God, you desire truth in the inward being. Teach me wisdom in my secret heart. And I underlined this part. When David confessed his sins, God graciously forgave him and helped him to make things right. So do we have God's forgiveness if we don't confess our sins? Or must we intentionally confess our sins to have God's forgiveness? I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. I, I think it is good that you confess your sin before God because it's a way of cleansing and, and it helps um, clear things. You know, you're, you're not harboring your guilt or your shame. So you're you're getting out, getting it out there and asking for forgiveness. And to ask for forgiveness, you need to recognize then <clears throat> your sin. And I think um, it, it's our sin is not always so plain. And um, I think my feeling is if David had been aware of his actions and how God would perceive them and how others would perceive them, he wouldn't have done what he did, but he, he sort of acted out of his own self pride or self whatever, which I think we fall into as well. That, um, you know, uh, so your question, whether or not God can forgive us if we don't admit our sin, I think is a really, that's, that's a good one. Um, and, and perhaps the prayer, you know, create a clean heart within me, restore, restore the right spirit within me, I think um, is a prayer that maybe we need to speak before God can show us what our hidden sins are because I know I have them and um, often become aware later. <laughs> oh, that was a good thing. You know, or, or that's where the regrets of our lives come in. Mm -hmm. um, again, I haven't answered your question because I don't, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't either. So we we always have God's grace, right? And mercy. Are those different than forgiveness? Or are they all wrapped up in one? I don't know. And maybe that's where this whole scapegoat. <laughs> I see Matt smiling over there. I think he's got. Mm -hmm. No, I just wonder if Stan's thinking the same thing. I wonder if Stan's going to say and we're going to no, go ahead and say, no, go ahead. You're, you're. Um, oh, that the whole notion of Jesus um, being the scapegoat and, you know, taking our filth and our stains upon himself uh, when we're either unaware of them or we can't get rid of them. They haunt us, you know. So what was Matt Stan going to say? Oh, I know. Hey, Lou and, and Grant, are you, uh, we, we don't see your picture, but I want to make sure you can, you're still there, so I'm assuming you can hear us. Is there anything you want to throw in here? Oh, 
I'm because I'm I'm not sure if this I'm assuming the sound is working on our end, but we haven't had a chance to test that out. So anyway, um, if we can't if you're saying something we can't hear you, you can put it in the chat and then I can share it out how loud too. So um, I think there's a kind of kind of a paradox here because I feel like we can never fully understand the impact of of our sin necessarily um and so if what you know following the the idea of the scapegoat if if the only sins that are put on the scapegoat are the ones that we are, are aware of to make make some sense then is it is it conditioned upon what we put or is it you know, is it more than that? Jesus died once for all. Um, so he's, he's defeated death, and yet sin and death kind of remain. So I don't want to put forgiveness as fully conditioned upon repentance. I'm kind of thinking out loud here. In other words, it's, it's, it's greater than our, our, I think, our ability to fully understand the trick. The, the depth of our sin or stain or, you know, um, but that doesn't make it, it, it's not, it's not realized in any fashion until we see forgiveness. So it's still there, but, you know, unless we, uh, unless we come repentant, we, we never really um, kind of receive it, but it's, it's already there. Help me out. I, I guess I would start with a definition of sin, which I think this definition is lacking. Because it, this definition seems to indicate that it's what we think, act, feel, and relate to others. I think sin is a power within us as well as what we do say, I think. Yes. Yeah. And... Um, Jesus died once and for all. For, he died for the sins of the world. Um, I think we have forgiveness, pure and simple. But I think, as Tom said, part of asking for forgiveness, repentance, uh, maybe is more for us than it is. I mean, God forgives us, period. And I think we ask for forgiveness because we need it. We, we need to know that somehow it becomes realized, I guess, and that's what Matt is saying too. Uh, but it doesn't take away the fact that we're already forgiven. Uh, in fact, first, first Peter, second, second Peter lists all kinds of positive qualities. And he says at the end of those positive qualities, chapter one, he says, if we lack any of those, we have forgotten that we are forgiven. <laughs> And then we're short-sighted. Um, so I don't know. I, it's something we already have, I think. But we need to do it. <laughs> I think mean, we've all heard people or ourselves um, talk about some of our past sins and that we know God has forgiven us, but obviously <coughs> some of us don't we don't forget it ourselves. So we don't really accept that God has forgiven us. You know, if you keep condemning yourself over and over. Uh, so I think <coughs> that realization is, is very important to one's uh, well-being <laughs> and acceptance of it. Yeah. And also, I guess, our growth as humans, mm -hmm. right? Like if Nathan had not come along and opened David's eyes to the to his sins, and David, well, I, I read a historical novel about David's life, King David's life, and just what a conflicted character and what an up and down mm -hmm. kind of extremes of, of goodness and really sin. Um, 
And, but, you know, it seemed like somebody needed to halt him in his tracks and say, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And sometimes it seems like the most successful people and the most powerful people are the most vulnerable <laughs> to uh, some of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Nathan, very few, sorry. Nathan was pretty bold about mm -hmm. telling the king, you know, I mean, he could have <laughs> had his throat cut. Mm -hmm. That's true. But I think the other remarkable part about this is that David, like, got it. Um, so I think that's why um, he's held up um, as one of the greats in the Bible because of his heart. Um, his heart really was for God, even though he was very human. And he really does embody or reveal the duality of our nature as humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The side of us that wants to do mm -hmm. good and the side that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Wayne, were you going to say something? I don't know. I kind of came on the slate. I was reading the Hebrews this week, and I just wondered if this verse might kind of relate to the conversation. It says, because by one sacrifice, he, you know, Jesus, has made perfect forever. That's interesting. Made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. So there's this kind of ongoing coverage, it seems like, that kind of helps us out. And when we're sort of goofed up <laughs> or, or inept or not aware, you know, and then we need a Nathan to come in and find something periodically to pick up. So there is both coverage and there's other resources to help us kind of do that, just to keep us in line, in his will, whatever it is. Yeah, that really appeals to me, that phrase, being made holy. Like it's a process. It's a process. Right. Process. Right. Yeah, would you, read, would you read that verse again? That's a, that's a good one. It's found in Hebrews 10, 14, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy and then goes on the holy spirit also testifies to us about this so you know there's that kind of confirmation it's that assurance that we have in christ that we can know where god kind of fills in gaps for us with the kindness of our hearts because the law is written on our hearts you know that's good thank you so much for being here thanks be to god <laughs> yeah right <laughs> So the next section in our book really goes into the scapegoat idea, page 94. And um, Leviticus 16 describes the ritual of the Day of Atonement, also known as the Day of Reconciliation. I'm just thinking, uh, maybe that's an, an easier way to deal with sin is to like throw it onto a scapegoat. You know, some the goat, the actual goat, as they used to do. Like, you know, there's one goat that gets one treatment and one goat gets scapegoated and then sent off into the wilderness. And sometimes um, those kind of concrete embodiments of a ritual, something that's abstract, you know, throw it onto something concrete and send it away and it's gone. <laughs> that seems easier to me than... than um, Sometimes then praying to a God that I can't see. Um, although I'm really glad that we don't do that to go <laughs> <laughs> animal cruelty. There'd be a lot of goats up in the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need another goat. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as I said earlier. It it hurts me that um, it hurts me that Jesus is our is our scapegoat. If we think of it in those words, I don't know. It seems to me that when we think of a scapegoat, that it removes our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh, just let him have it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that when when it's available, we're gee, great, okay, that'll get me out of this situation. 
let's just give it to Jesus. Yeah. So I'm not real crazy about this theme. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> Although I can see, I can see why this is an understanding of Jesus' work. Sure. I mean, like on page 95, uh, yeah, sort of middle upper paragraph. And we see a man who right, is referring to Aaron here. We see a man overcome with grief, not just performing ritualized cleansing for the guilt of a nation, but trying to cleanse his own guilt and the guilt of his past. And it is here that humanity discovers that some stains are too hard to just scrub away with soap and water. The deeper stains of guilt and shame require something stronger, something far beyond our ability to cleanse on our own. And so, Jean, like you were saying, there's some comfort in, in being able to give things to God, right? Being able to know that. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I, mean, I, I definitely understand what you guys were saying, too. When I think about Jesus and his whole crucifixion, it just seems horrible. But when, when it's abstracted, it, it, um, it adds to the storyline. It, it helps with, um, yeah. The bones. Right. I know that. Yeah. Was, like, when I was sitting here, like, if only we'd have gotten down and burnt the day before, I could have said goodbye to that, but we didn't. <laughs> yeah right all those all those if onlys that we that we tend to have if only i had been more disciplined i wouldn't have given into temptation if only i handled that differently i would have made a dumb mistake if only we were a better parent or spouse if only you know if only if only um and those are things that in the past we can't change we can't change right so I think that's a wonderful time to pray to God, you know, just to, to relieve ourselves of that burden. Because I think they said somewhere in this chapter that, that those kinds of things, our regrets and our shame and our guilt, interfere in our relationship with God and in our relationship with other people and with ourselves. And so, you know, to give ourselves some relief from that and kind of... So like you said, Wayne, the process, the process of becoming. That's what the goes. Okay, and then, um, and this is from Hebrews on the bottom of page 96. Would anybody like to read that part aloud? How the author of Hebrews describes Jesus as the new Aaron, our new high priest, and the scapegoat that makes us clean from our sins. <clears throat> I can read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Christ has, uh, has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have happened. He passed through the greater and more perfect meeting tent, which isn't made by human hand. That is, it's not part of this world. He entered the Holy of Holies once for all by his own blood not only by by the blood of goats or calves securing our deliverance for all time for all time if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkled ashes of, of cows made spiritually con contaminated people holy and clean how much more will the blood of jesus wash our consciences clean from dead works in order to serve the living god he offered himself to god through the eternal spirit as a sacrifice without any flaw. Thank you. Thank you. So I underlined deliverance for all time. For all time. Yeah. And then the other, neck below there, there's a passage from Titus. Someone like say just because of the mercy not because of the righteous things we have done. He did through the washing and new birth and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. 
Thank you, John. And so in there for me, it's like none, none of these understandings of the cross for me are completely separate from the other understandings of the cross. They're kind of interwoven. And there was one earlier, or we discussed anyway, the earlier time about it, it's not by our works. It's by the grace of God that we are, we are saved. Um, and yet there's the moral example of Christ chapter where it is, you know, the moral example is that we are doing good works. <laughs> it's just all, maybe it's all of it. It's just all of it. And then below that, there's the first epistle of John. But if we live in the light in the same way as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. Every sin. Ooh, you know, there are times when I think every sin, like every sin, every single sin committed by any person ever is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Sometimes that's hard for me. Mm -hmm. Our author um, included this beautiful passage written by Flannery O'Connor on page 98. And, uh, it's a prayer. It's a prayer. Any thoughts anybody wants to share about that? A bit by Flannery O'Connor. Well, I agree. It's a lovely thought and <laughs> imagery. Mm -hmm. It's very personal to her and mm -hmm. we can relate to. Yeah. I guess the part that sticks with me is um, I'm afraid, dear God, that my, sh my self shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon and I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. Okay. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me push myself aside. <laughs> okay. And so then we get to this part about. Is it Embessy? Is that how you pronounce that name? Embessy's Law of the Conservation of Filth. <laughs> yeah. And the law is in order for something to become clean, something else must become dirty. Like when you wash your car, the dirt goes somewhere, it's onto the ground. And the author says on 101, in Bessie's law is a practical law, but it's also a biblical and theological law too. In order for sin to go away, sin has to go somewhere. For us to be clean, to become clean, to have our sin removed, something or someone has to become dirty. What do you think about that? <clears throat> That's the only means. God could come up with <laughs> 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 I mean, that really <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, well, I see the connection, but is it biblical? <laughs> I guess I don't know. That. There's another question. Well, there's an absoluteness, though, to sin. Um, and that is, you know, um, one violation of the law makes you guilty of the of violating the entire law, and that the wage of sin is death. So, um, and, and I think that's the point the author's trying to make is that it's there. You can't just slough it aside in order for it to be dealt with. Jesus has to take it away. 
I'm wondering too, Wayne, about is this is this biblically <clears throat> biblically biblically based? Like, do you know? Or the investi I don't. I've never. I don't know who. I was just looking up investi to That's see. That's what I was doing. Um, who? Yeah, you can Google it. <laughs> yeah, I. You know whether whoever the guy is based on biblical ideas. I don't know, but um, Paul says that God made Christ to be sin in order that we might become the righteousness of God. This author doesn't ever quote that as part of this scapegoat kind of thing. But uh, in a sense, that's the same thing as this law. Christ becomes sin so that we might be righteous. <laughs> we might be clean. Mm -hmm. um, Sort of go out on the limb here. I've been struggling with this. So it's so much of our theology uh, kind of rooted in the blood of Christ and what happened to Christ, right? I mean, some, but the people who talk most about that, it seems like in scripture, are, are Jews trying to put Christ's life and ministry in a Jewish context, which was covenantal and sacrificial. So it's sort of a contextualization of the gospel in the sense to say that, that it all had to be this way, but it gives sort of an absolute sense about what Jesus means. It gives a specific kind of meaning, I think, to Jewish listeners for that. It gives less meaning, honestly, to me in some sense, although I've appreciated the richness of that imagery, but I've wondered, I mean, how, how necessary is it that it's done that way? That's kind of the record that we have. It made sense to Jews. And I kind of wondered, gosh, if Jews deny this, once you've kind of laid out all these connections, you know, God help them in a sense if they don't see the connections. Because I think Christ came to the Jews first, you know, and then on to the rest of us. But I still can't help but think there's some other ways that God is working in the world. And um, and I don't want to deny this. I don't, it sounds heretical almost, but I almost feel like a lot of the Bible or understanding the interpretation of what happened in the, those first four gospels is some reflective thinking on a part of some very smart Jewish people who understood their system very well and trying to help make that transition to that old system to see how Christ kind of fulfilled that. And I, I'm not sure where that leaves me. I'm okay with it, but I, again, I sort of feel like there's some other ways God probably works through Christ and through his spirit in the world. And uh, I'm not trying to deny that because I think that's pretty dang good, you know, but it seems kind of almost small. Kara mm -hmm. said, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wayne, um, have you gone one step further to begin to think what might be another way of picturing it? Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not even sure I want to go there though, because okay. I, okay. you know, I could get lost really quick. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think I know some people who kind of come through theological training who've been down that road. You know, it's a little bit frightening. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, and have left the church and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it, it just sort of hovers out here <laughs> these days. <laughs> what can I say? Blessings on you. <laughs> I, think, I think that's for. That's why there are six chapters in a book on atonement as opposed to just one, right? In terms of an explanation, they all kind of fall fall short on some at some point. And any analogy, uh, you know, any any analogy is is only going to carry so far. Um, 
you know, that, that uh, the words that we use to address God, um, they're, they're, they're always going to be somewhat limited. You know, somebody says father, what are they thinking of? You know, a lot of different. And I, I think the other part I would say is that maybe on some level of a beauty of where we are right now, um, and maybe something that might be unsettling in some ways, is uh, we're starting to hear the gospel in through a lot of different voices um, that, you know, is pretty much dominated more male Western throughout, you know, the course of, uh, of history. And now we're starting to hear people and, you know, share their, um, their understanding from, from all these different perspectives that maybe there aren't Western or, uh, or from, you know, voices uh, not, not heard. Um, that I think it expands the depth of, of meaning, but there is a limitation, of course, to, um, you know, at some level, the understanding of God from an ancient world and uh, through ancient practices that, you know, that's a particular lens that, you know, we're, we're peering back in time with our own kind of uh, sort of filters, I suppose, in, in life. Um, this law of the conservation of filth. When I think of that, uh, you know, the dirt goes somewhere, but there's also that dirt gets renewed and is useful in a sense. It, it, there's a cycle to it. Do we ever so, figure out who the messy is, by the way? No, they just keep. Is that a lot? Is that like a Murphy? It's like there's no yeah, one yeah. Murphy kind of thing. I've, oh, I've yeah, never, I I've never heard it before. Yeah, I haven't either. I need to get out. Okay. Well, that little section ends on page 102 um, with the author saying it's a whole lot easier to spread dirt around <laughs> than it is to clean dirt up. It's a whole lot easier for human beings in an effort to, to rid themselves of their sins to infect other people with those sins. And they were to just kind of tend to, maybe it's through blame or I don't know what, you know. There's only one way to be fully cleansed of sin and that is through Jesus Christ. And then there's this section about the two bowls. Another way to think about cleansing. Um, the first, the author considers Pontius Pilate who followed his sentencing of Jesus to death by washing his hands. We don't know why, but when he washed his hands, perhaps he was absolving himself of any opportunity to do what was costly and what was risky and what was right, which would have been to stand up for Jesus and not convict him to death. Um, I was sort of taken aback by the author's statement. Well, it's a quote from, um, Anglican priest Morton Kelsey he didn't, and it's on page 103 he didn't have the courage to stand for what he knew was right it was because of this relatively small flaw in Pilate's character that Jesus died on the cross Bruce and I were talking about that last night and we were thinking really? because of one small flaw in one man's character that's why Jesus died on the cross? Yeah, when we were thinking about it, I, I think the circumstances that God chose for his son to come to earth were well planned, well thought out, like multiple pieces on a, on a, a chessboard, each moving in a very specific way to lead to this ultimate sacrifice and, and wonderful gift that we all receive. Um, the, the risk is to think of, of Christ's death as tragic as it is and as horribly unjust as it is, as being only that. It's triumphant. It's death being defeated. And it's God's will being acted out. And so to kind of pin it on one guy, we thought was sort of, it's like he's one of many people. There was also Judas Iscariot. There was also the high priest. There were all these people who conspired and by their own actions and their own simple-mindedness and selfishness 
uh, uh, was, were able to be used by God to create the circumstance under which Jesus was crucified. And on top of that, there's our sin. Yeah. <laughs> also yeah. Right from there. Yeah. So, yeah, it becomes complicated. Yeah. It kind of speaks to the pervasive interconnectedness of the sin and evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then <clears throat> and then we're we're drawn to the hand washing bowl of Pilate as a direct contrast to the foot washing bowl of Jesus. In your sermon today. Yeah. So, do <clears throat> you think Judas or Pilate were, let's maybe Judas, let's go with, was Judas forgiven? I think he could have been <laughs> forgiven, but we don't know. We don't know Judas's heart. It would have to be, Judas would have to repent of his sin. Since he hung himself, I don't know. Um, it, I, I don't think that's for us to know. There's potential that he could have been, I think, even his sin. But that's between God and Judas. I don't know what Judas's heart was. Again, he killed himself, so you know. he was remorseful. He was well. Couldn't live with himself, right? There wasn't there a wasn't there pa a passage where Jesus was talking about the one who betrays him as would have been better if it wasn't the Lord. All right, well, it's about time for us to wrap up, unfortunately. And the author in this last um, sentence is on page one hundred four. Um, throws us back into, I think, the paradox. So he says, let's remember we cannot clean up our own life. Instead, we need only depend on what God has offered to us through Jesus Christ. Because on the cross and through the empty tomb, God's very own heart has been poured out for all creation to cleanse and purify even the nastiest stains. The cross cleanses, purifies, and washes us of our sins. And if we confess our sins, we receive the all-purpose, all-powerful, stain-fighting work of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so it's that paradox again. We're forgiven, but if we confess our sins, then we, then we receive. All right. Would anyone like to close us in prayer today? I feel like I should sing you a song. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> you know this one? I, I read this chapter, and it was just took me back. Sitting on the pew of the fourth, fifth, sixth grade. What can more show me? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me more like you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Okay, our closing prayer. Lord God, may we live each day knowing that we are clean and pure in your sight. We praise you for the grace and mercy you have shown us, and we thank you for your cleansing love that renews us day after day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So next week, I read ahead this chapter. Chris, Chris does, I don't know. He's, Chris is Victor. Chris is Victor. Overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Don will be leading next week because Bruce and I will be out of town. So. Everybody has a great week. Thank you.